two images have captured my attention this week. The first is the photograph of US President Donald Trump self-consciously holding a Bible in front of the building of St John's Episcopal Church in Washington DC, immediately after announcing his intention to bring in the military to quell the worst unrest in American cities since the 1960s. The second is less well publicised but is carried in Christianity today. It's an image of the late George Floyd whose appalling death in police custody ignited the current unrest. And he is also holding a Bible as he towered over a small group of other African-American men. Two men, both Americans, but with radically different stories and both holding up the same book. As a church that claims Bible-centeredness as a core value and has invested in Bible translation for decades, this has to matter to us. So what are we to make? of these two images of the Bible. The first in the hand of the most powerful man on earth, the second in the hand of a largely unknown man from an underprivileged background, but known locally as Big Floyd, who wanted to see, quotes, young men put guns down and have Jesus instead of the streets. In a simulating blog post on the issues, Eddie Arthur, one of our church's sent mission partners, comments, at the best of times, I feel uneasy about church buildings and Bibles being used as props for a photo op, and these are not the best of times. I share his concern, and believe it is best for politicians of all persuasions to avoid appearing to use religion for party po political advantage, or for the suppression of free speech, which is such an important part of democratic life. However, as Eddie goes on to say, the Bible does speak into many political issues. And we need both to hear its voice and communicate its challenge, including on the issues of racial tension that stand behind the current unrest our friends in the US are experiencing. To put it differently, holding up a Bible means nothing. Hearing its message and letting it change you is what matters. And if we do that honestly, we will all find our attitudes to people from other races and backgrounds being deeply challenged and our hearts being prized open to welcome and love people who are pushed to the margins of our society. This is simply inescapable in the book of Acts, which we're exploring in our morning services this term. It begins with the promise of the Holy Spirit's power for the church to be witnesses of Christ to the ends of the earth, Acts 1.8. And then in Acts 2, the supernatural gift of tongues on the day of Pentecost immediately enables the message of Jesus to spread in multiple cultures and language groups. And from there, the message does spread out from Jerusalem through Judea into Samaria and finally all the way to Rome, the dominant city of the ancient world. At a key turning point in that story, Peter, a Jewish apostle, is called to the home of Cornelius, a Roman soldier, to share the good news with him. Once again, the Holy Spirit comes in power and Peter concludes, I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. That's in Acts chapter 10. We need to be clear, there is no room for racism of any kind in the Church of Jesus Christ. And like ancient Israel, we are called to treat the stranger who lives with you as the native among you, Leviticus 19. For every human being is created in the image of God and therefore of inestimable value. In the words of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, to treat one person as if they were less than this is not just evil, it is downright blasphemous, for it is really like spitting in the face of God. And the good news of Jesus is for all people, overcoming hostility and prejudice and bringing together people from every nation, tribe and language, as Revelation 7 tells us. So at this time, let's feel the pain of our American friends and join with them in praying for peace on their streets and for justice for those who feel unheard and hopeless and marginalised and for reconciliation within communities. Let's pray and give thanks for those who are courageously reaching across perceived social divisions in humility and friendship. But let us not imagine that this is a challenge only in America, but realise it's a challenge for the UK too. 
including right here in Southampton. In fact, it is our challenge because people from many nations are our neighbours who live on our streets. And Jesus is calling us to reach out to them in friendship, whatever our background. It is also our challenge because people from many nations gather in our church, which is a great joy to me. But Jesus is calling us all to take the initiative in crossing cultural barriers to make new friends and to make our church a genuinely visible, global community. Let's pray. That will be our experience. Lord Jesus, you are the hope of the nations, as we so often sing. And you are the saviour of the world. Good news for people from every nation, tribe and language. We worship you. We praise you. And we ask that as citizens in Southampton and as members of our church community, you would make us those who reflect the generosity of your heart to people from all races, nations and backgrounds, enabling them to find a home in your church. And Father, for our friends in America, with all the tension and difficulty that they're experiencing right now, we pray for peace, we pray for courage, we pray for justice, we pray for reconciliation, we pray for voices that will bring peace rather than stoke hostility. Have mercy, we pray, on this nation as we give you thanks for America and its huge contribution to the global community. And Father, we open our hearts to your Holy Spirit, praying that he would prize them wider and wider in generosity to people from all backgrounds, to reach out to them, to be concerned for justice for them and to share with them the life-changing good news of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.